uh, now we move to our next speaker, Ben Dabari. Um, he anticipated that there might be technical problems, so he has actually a pre-recorded talk for us, but he'll be here for the Q&A uh, live. So, Christine, if you please start the pre-recorded talk of Ben that is on functional interdependence in coupled dissipative structures. Christine? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for joining. My name is Ben Dabari. I'm going to tell you about some exciting research from our group that investigates some coordinative properties of non-living dissipative structures. Let's dive in. Dissipative structures are self-organized systems driven by flows of energy and matter. An example is the phenomenon of convection rolls, where a fluid subject to a thermal gradient can form these cyclic vortices of rising hot liquid and falling cool liquid that propagate through the system to form these cells. Dissipative structures then depend on a dissipative flow, in this case the flow of heat, that maintains some kind of structure, in this case the physical cells. Dissipative structures also manifest in chemical systems, for example in oscillating autocatalytic reactions, as well as in electrical systems like the one we'll talk about today. A core hypothesis of our group is that living systems are themselves a type of dissipative structure. And we expect that because of this, some of the generic capabilities and properties of organisms will also be generic to non-living dissipative structures. And so we study those non-living dissipative structures to look for biological properties. One such system that we work with is the Electrical Self-Organized Foraging Implementation, or eSOFI. What you see are a set of metal beads in a dish with shallow oil, subject to a high electrical voltage delivered by a source electrode above the dish. Charges are sprayed out, they build up on the beads and on the surface of the oil, which drives the beads to form these structures called trees. The trees maintain contact with a grounding electrode, in this case a metal ring, in the dish. This is a dissipative structure. The dissipative component is the flow of charges through the system that maintain a structure in the form of the trees. The trees are rudimentarily end-directed to maximize the rate of entropy production. That is, we observe the system self-selects for morphologies and behaviors that maximize the current flowing through the system, maximize the dissipation, and thus the rate of entropy production. Since the uh, current maintains the structure of the system, any activities that increase that flow can be considered functional in the sense of um, maintaining the structure of the system. There is a lovely analogy to biology in that the tree structures, like organisms, move through their world to find the energetic resources that sustain their structure, much like the foraging of biology. We're going to look at some of the coordinative capabilities of those ESOFI tree structures. And we're going to do this by applying a framework from psychology known as the coordinative structure. Coordinative structures are essentially self-organized assemblies of physiological constituents. These constituents being, for example, muscles, nerves, joints, or anything to be controlled in doing a particular activity. They could also be individual organisms in the case of interpersonal coordination. Coordinative structures have essentially three properties. Bidirectional coupling between the constituents. They have to have some mutual dependencies in their dynamics. They are functionally specific 
in that the coordinative structure is set up for a particular task and they are softly assembled, which means that the dynamics of the constituents or the structure are flexible for changing contexts. For example, consider the task of holding a glass of water. We treat the hand as a coordinated structure. It is this self-organized assembly of physiological constituents, in this case, joints, nerves, and muscles in the fingers that are bidirectionally coupled. They have mutual dependencies um, facilitated probably by the nervous tissue. The hand is set up in a functionally specific way in that it is set up in order to grasp a cup and it is softly assembled. It's not rigidly just a grasping device, but it could grasp a variety of different types of cups and it could be a completely different device, such as a typing device rather than a grasping device. Coordinated structures exhibit a interesting phenomenon known as reciprocal compensation, where if you perturb it, you'll observe systematic system level reorganization that compensates for that perturbation. And this manifests typically with a behavioral response that facilitates the functional compensation. Consider if I'm grasping the cup, if my thumb is perturbed such that it's not able to produce the appropriate amount of force to keep the cup from falling, there will be compensations in the other fingers that increase their force production to stabilize the task. The behavioral response then is the increase in the force production and the functional compensation is that the task is actually stabilized, the cup is maintained. Coordinated structures are generic to a variety of contexts in biology. They were originally studied in speech. They are observed in the coordination of finger movements and grip. And very interestingly, they're observed in interpersonal context where two individuals have to coordinate their behaviors. Since the coordinative structure is so generic to coordination biology, we expected that it might be generic to dissipative structures of the non-living variety as well. We proceeded to investigate whether the ESOFI can exhibit reciprocal compensation that would be indicative of a coordinative structure. First, we consider if the ESOFI has the three properties of a coordinated structure. As we understand it, the trees are coupled through the charge distribution. Consider that the forces that drive the tree's motion depend on how the charges are distributed in the dish, and also that the trees, by conducting charges to ground, shape that distribution of charges in the dish. Each tree modulates the charge distribution, which causes a change in the forces on the other tree. And this enables a um, coupling facilitated by the mutual modulation of the charge distribution. So they are in fact coupled. We've noted that the system has this functional aspect in that it tries to maximize the rate of dissipation and to maintain stability and the system is softly assembled. The dynamics and the structure of the system are flexible for changing context. Here's a video of the experimental setup. You'll notice we have two separate trees that are situated on distinct grounding electrodes. They are constrained such that their activity is just this pivoting oscillation Below the dish, you'll see a magnet here that can be raised up to lock down tree one. This constitutes our functional perturbation to the system. By locking down tree one, the motion is reduced and its ability to draw current is also impaired. If the ESOFI exhibits reciprocal compensation, if it behaves as a coordinated structure, we expect that tree two should have some changes in its behavior that 
facilitate an increase in the current that it draws, thus compensating for the functional impairment, the loss of current from tree one. The experiments were conducted in two phases, a 10 minute phase where both trees are freely oscillating, the unlocked phase, and a 10 minute phase where tree one is constrained, the locked phase. We will report two of our dependent variables here. A behavioral measure of tree two will look at its oscillation amplitude. We picked this because the oscillation amplitude will correspond to the amount of the charge distribution that the tree is sampling and how much of the charge distribution the tree is sampling will correspond to uh, how much current it's drawing. And then we'll also measure a functional variable. We'll just measure the average current conducted by each tree within each phase. We also included a manipulation of the coupling level because we expect that the magnitude of the compensation from tree two should depend on how tightly coupled the trees actually are. Again, the trees are coupled through the shared distribution of charges on the oil, and we should be able to change the degree to which they're coupling by changing the degree to which they are pulling charges from the same region of the charge distribution. In the high coupling condition, they are roughly side by side, like in the video that you saw, and so they're pulling from roughly the same distribution of charges in the dish. In the medium coupling condition, they are further apart, oriented at 90 degrees. And in the low coupling condition, they are opposite each other and further apart still. We chose this pattern of orientations to increase the distance between trees while maintaining each tree's distance from the source electrode. Let's take a look at the results. Looking first at the current, for both trees within each of the unlocked and locked phases, we see that tree one has significantly reduced current during the locked phase. This makes sense, this is what we expect. The imposition of the magnet to constrain it does have this functional consequence of reducing the current that it draws. Really interestingly, we observe that tree two's current increases during the locked phase. So there does appear to be this functional compensation. And that is facilitated by a change in tree two's dynamics measured by the oscillation amplitude. We see that tree two's oscillation amplitude increases during the locked phase, which means it's sampling a broader region of the charge distribution, which would facilitate that increase in the current. If we look across the coupling conditions, we see that during the medium coupling condition, tree one is similarly perturbed and tree two similarly has an increase in the current, but to a lesser degree. That increase in the current is again facilitated by an increase in the oscillation amplitude, and again by a lesser degree. In the low coupling condition, the trees appear to be effectively uncoupled, because tree two exhibits no increase in current, and also no increase in oscillation amplitude. We thus have what we expect to see in a coordinated structure exhibiting reciprocal compensation. There is this functional compensation in the currents, and it's facilitated by a behavioral response in a distal part of the system. And the manipulation of the coupling does seem to uh, modulate the magnitude of that compensatory response. As another tool to understand this reciprocal compensation phenomenon and to corroborate it, we did some simulations of the system. We used a slightly reduced simplified model of the eSOFI, where rather than looking at the entire trees and modeling them in two-dimensional space, we just modeled the tip beads moving along an approximately one-dimensional space and sampling from a one-dimensional charge distribution. The model consists essentially of just three coupled differential equations 
that represent the charge distribution plotted in dark blue over here and the forces on each of the beads as a function of that charge distribution. We see that the two beads in the vertical blue and pink lines move through the space as a function of where the charges are and they deplete charges wherever they go. So it nicely uh, simulates what's happening in the real system. We simulate the perturbations by including a magnetic force on bead one that can lock it down and constrain its motion, just like in the ESOFI. We can also simulate the variation in the coupling strength by restricting the beads to increasingly disparate locations of the charge distribution. In the high coupling condition, they are restricted to relatively neighboring regions of the charge distribution. So they're pulling from relatively uh, the same regions of the charge distribution. In the median coupling condition, they are further apart. And in the low coupling condition, they are further still. We can look at the same measures in the simulated system. The mean current shows the same pattern of results where bead one has reduced current during the locked phase and bead two has increased current during the locked phase. Bead two's increase in current is again facilitated by this increase in the oscillation amplitude. Looking across the coupling levels, we see again the same pattern of results where B2 continues to have the functional compensation where its current increases during the locked phase. And this is again facilitated by an increase in the oscillation amplitude, but the magnitude of that response decreases with decreasing coupling. Again, we have this functional compensation and the behavioral response that is indicative of a coordinated structure exhibiting reciprocal compensation. This project was particularly interesting because we were able to apply some tools from the social sciences, this concept of coordinated structures, to explain the behavior of a non-living dissipative structure. It also, I think, points to how we can begin to integrate some of the tools from non-equilibrium thermodynamics to explain biological behavior. For example, in this context of biological coordination, there's a variety of media that facilitate coupling between physiological constituents and enable coordination broadly. For example, the physiology can be coupled by neural linkages, shared mechanical forces, or chemical signaling pathways. And in the case of interpersonal coordination, individual organisms are coupled through informational fields like structured light and sound. By understanding the sort of physical coupling of the ESOFI, we suggest we can develop a generic framework for explaining these myriad coupling mechanisms. If we look at the ESOFI again, recall there was this fundamental reciprocity between the charge distribution and the tree activities, and it was the mutual modulation of the charge distribution that enabled a functional coupling between both trees. In the case of biology, rather than diffuse electrical fields, organisms are coupled by informational fields. For example, we could share a light field that we both mutually modulate by moving and reflecting light differently, and which we are both constrained by. It provides information with which we structure our behaviors. We think there's a essential similarity between these processes and the physics might provide a general framework for explaining the biological phenomena. And I will plug that we have a publication that is upcoming in the journal Ecological Psychology that more explicitly outlines this hypothesis. Thank you very much for joining for this talk. Thanks, of course, to my collaborators for their help on this project. And thanks to the coordinators of this conference, I'm sure that it was immensely difficult to adapt for this online format. If you don't get a chance to talk to me during the Q&A session, please feel free to email me here. Here are all the references well, I used Thank for this you. talk. In particular, the second reference
is what I alluded to that more explicitly outlines this hypothesis of connecting the coordination of biology and the coordination we observe in dissipative structures and the sorts of language and tools of physics that we could use to elaborate that story. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ben. And I'm sure that people can send you their, their questions.